Hi, I'm Christian Kersting. I'm from the Technical University of Darmstadt and I'm also co-director of the recently established Hessian Center for Artificial Intelligence. Thank you for the invitation. It's really exciting to be part of such an, also in my opinion, interdisciplinary meeting. And what I would like to talk about is how to make deep neural networks right for the right scientific reasons towards the third wave of AI. So we are really facing challenges. And one of these challenges is whether science can help to feed a world, right? We all know that our agriculture output uh, cannot really, in, uh, has to be increased without really increasing the amount of land used. So in my opinion, in order to tackle this really great challenge, um, we have to seamless interlocking AI and agriculture or crop sciences. And um, the exciting thing about that is that this way we, we are not only helping crop science, but actually it's also a push for AI. And this is what I would like to also show you in this talk. So I guess we all by now know that data are ubiquitous and have really great value for understanding um, data that we have collected. Let's say um, in plant phenotyping, we are measuring uh, using hyperspectral imaging uh, plants and we would like to understand how they react on stress, biological, uh, biotic or uh, abiotic stress. However, data is not everything. What we would like to have in AI ultimately, or at least at the next step, is AI system that can acquire human-like communication and reason capabilities with the ability to recognize new situation adapt. And I think crop science is a great example why we need that. And this is what I would like to convince you of in this talk and also show that we can really make major steps into this direction. So let's see. Um, deep neural networks are pretty exciting. They have led to many breakthroughs. I guess you know um, the breakthroughs of chess, Go, Atari games, but also in many other um, subfields of AI, like um, maybe voice assistants, NLP, and so on and so on. And actually, if you move into the natural sciences, physics, but also um, crop science, you can see a lot of use of deep neural networks in there for many, many different tasks. Um, my group, we also managed, for example, to be the world champion, not in chess, but in drop chess. And drop chess is a uh, more tricky chess variant. So here you can, when you capture a piece, you can reintroduce it into the game um, using your color at any time. And if you apply, for example, alpha zero um, architectures, they cannot deal with this new situation, with this new task. And for example, they try to put pieces then um, on squares that are already occupied. So what you have to do is you have to adapt the underlying architecture of the deep neural networks. So it means that we have to work very hard to typically to get deep neural networks to really run. And it's actually more tricky because there are several cases where you may get very good performance, prediction performance, but you're not really sure what the deep neural network is doing. I mean, mathematically, of course, we can tell you what the deep neural network is doing, but semantically, what does it really make um, in, in the task at hand? How does it justify its decisions or predictions? And there's a, an exciting new area which is called explainable AI that is trying to address this challenge. And here you see one of these approaches by the group of Klaus Robert Müller in Berlin, where they were showing that actually deep neural networks can really show what is called clever Hans um, moments. That means they make predictions for the wrong reasons. They make use of confounders that might exist in your data. Very, very nice work. Unfortunately, this work does not suggest any way to fix the issue. So essentially you're left with, damn it, my neural network is not doing what it's supposed to do. 
So the question is, can we actually correct it? Can we actually um, help the user now, in particular domain experts, in correcting this neural network? And so our idea about how to gain trust into machine learning is a combination of explainable AI, because understanding is really one corner of trust. On the other hand, if you look at um, cognitive science, it's also clear that in order to gain trust, you would like to interact with people, with machines, with what you would like to trust. So our idea was to come up with a new learning setting, which we called explanatory interactive learning that we presented at AIES uh, um, last year. And the real brain behind this work is Stefano Tees. So let me explain how that works. So imagine that, and it's by now a classical example that was used a lot in the literature, in particular, if you know a little bit about limes, which is uh, another way to explain uh, machine learning predictors. The task is to distinguish huskies and wolves. So you get images of husky and wolves, and you learn your favorite, um, let's say, deep neural network to predict whether you see a husky or a wolf. Right Now, you can make use of explainable AI to ask for any of these decisions on the images, please explain me, please tell me locally which pixels are you, you have you used essentially to make your predictions. Now, what you can see here, in order to make the prediction, apparently you're not looking at the object that you're interested in here, wolf husky, but actually you look into the background, right? So essentially, you would like to provide the feedback, yes, indeed, it's a husky, let's say you predicted husky, but not because of the snow, not because of those pixels. This is what you would like to now provide as feedback. And if you do that now in a loop, so the deep network is training, you provide feedback on the explanations, uh, the deep network continues to learn, taking this feedback into account and so on, then you get this loop and this is what we call the explanatory interactive loop. How do we do that? How do we correct um, our predictor? Well, for now we are looking at false positive segments. And so whenever it makes a prediction that is correct, but for the wrong reasons, we would like to provide this feedback and there are different ways. One of the earlier approaches was uh, by Ross et al which assumes a differentiable loss. And essentially what you're coding here in the right reasons, you're trying to mask the wrong parts. So essentially you use, uh, you tell the system, please don't make use of these pixels. And how do they typically during training make use of these pixels? Well, the gradients, and this is essentially what you code here. So you're masking those away that they should not use. What we were presenting um, was a model agnostic approach. So that also works if you have not a differentiable loss. And we are doing that by generation, uh, generating counter examples. So if we say we get these false positive segments, what we can now do is we can generate several versions of the same image where we put random noise into the irrelevant pixels. And that has a similar effect without us um, having to provide a differentiable loss. So does it work? Yes, um, it works, at least if you look at standard benchmarks. So here we were looking at a, a fashion amnest, and depending on how many counter examples you're providing, you can get similar, in some cases, even better um, performance than the um, right for the right reason uh, approach, so this differential approach. Um, here's another example that we were using in our recent Nature Machine Intelligence publication on that, which is really picking up what Klaus Robert Müller's um, group was doing. And so and the standard example they are using is you have images with horses in there and images without horses in there. And your task is, for example, to tell whether there's a horse or not. Now it turns out that you get 100% predictive accuracy but only because all of the horse images, they were actually having a copyright notice in the upper left corner, actually the same copyright notice. So this is what you can get from the explainable AI, the, for example, relevance propagation technique, 
And now you could say, no, no, don't, please don't use these pixels. And then by going into the loop, you can see that it automatically corrects and starts focusing on more interesting areas, more plausible areas. Of course, you can now interactively, if for whatever reason, there are other confounders in here, you could also provide um, the insight. Don't use that, that part as well. We also conducted a user study where we tried really our best in terms of experimental design to really see whether there's any benefit, whether we really build up trust by that. And um, our results very well match what is also in a sense known from the literature, namely that without explanation, people trust highly accurate machines, but the trust drops when wrong behavior is witnessed. So, right, so somehow we have a prior that machines they are accurate, right? We expect that they are accurate. Now, because we have explanations, um, we can also show that if you provide explanations, then this helps to increase trust in early iterations where the machine is not performing very well, but only if they are correct. Again, we have this bias or this prior in there that machines should be correct. The main takeaway here from the user study is that people really do not forgive wrong explanations. So there is a benefit in providing explanations, but they should also be correct, right? So we have to be really, really careful about explanations. And I think that fits very well also if you talk to humans that you really hate wrong explanations. Now, should we care about that if we do crop science? And here's an example that I think illustrates well that we indeed should. So we were gathering um, hyperspectral images of plants um, placed in agar. And some of the plants in there, they were having a biotic stress and others were not. They were just healthy. So we were running some um, deep neural network on this hyperspectral uh, imaging data. And guess what? We were getting almost perfect predictions. So we got a little bit scared. And so we asked again, using relevance propagation or GRADCAM or what other method you want to use, please explain. And what you can see, and in several cases, it actually makes the right predictions, but for the wrong reasons. Namely, it's looking at the fringe or even on the agar instead of looking at the plant tissue, right? That's much more important than the agar. The agar is not a biological plausible reason why a plant is suffering from some stress. Now applying this loop that we have seen, you can actually show that you can correct for the confounders in there and for this wrong behavior and it starts moving into the plant parts and really trying to get biologically more plausible um, arguments. Um, we have also um, analyzed then, of course, how does the predictive accuracy get affected by that? And yes, of course, you may go down a little bit in the predictive accuracy, but depending on um, your data set, you may even increase. But keep in mind, we are here also in the natural sciences, so maybe predictive performance is not everything, but we would like to gain insights. And that's what you get here as well. So without this human revision, without the human in the loop, you just get two clusters. And what we are showing here are the uh, a low dimensional embedding of the embeddings that are learned by the neural network. And you essentially get just two clusters, namely healthy tissue and background. But now by providing the human revisions and continue to learn, all of a sudden you get different types of healthy tissues and also partially healthy tissues and also stressed tissues, right? So you finally get the insight that you would like to have, or at least you get representation that you can then continue to gain insights in your own research. So with that, let me conclude. I hope I have convinced you that there's an exciting um, new research area ahead that we may call at least one step towards the third wave of AI. And that this is also nice because it's interdisciplinary research together with you as the domain experts, but also within computer science, um, the third wave of AI 
need really all kinds of computers, like software engineering, databases, human computer interaction. You even have to work hard together with computational cognitive science because we want to understand humans as well, right? Thanks for your attention.